All right. Hello and welcome to the April 2024 Collaboration Cafe webinar sponsored by the Midwest Big Data Innovation Hub with support from the National Science Foundation. I'm John McMullen, Executive Director of the Hub, and today we'll be exploring a longstanding and foundation-wide program from NSF that is focused on supporting the development of early career faculty in their research, uh, in their teaching, uh, as we'll hear about. Uh, to help us understand this opportunity and, and to take some questions about that, I'm very happy to have uh, Dr. Jenny Lee from NSF here today. Uh, Dr. Lee is a program director in the Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure at NSF, uh, which is in the Size Directorate. Um, she has responsibility for several cyber infrastructure research and education programs, uh, as well as being uh, one of the folks in size who is responsible for the career program as well. So thank you very much for being here. We appreciate your time today. Thank you, John. Um, today, we also have a prior awardee of the career program on the call to tell us a little about her experience uh, with the proposal and, and how that award has affected her research uh, trajectory. So welcome to Dr. Crystal Liu as well. Uh, she's an associate professor in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Organismal Biology at Iowa State University. Thanks, Crystal, for being here as well. Thank you, John. Um, so we'll get started with a, a quick overview of the program. Uh, and uh, I wanted to mention that these slides are available on our website uh, now. And so if you're interested in following along uh, with any of the links that we'll share, uh, you can find those on our site. Um, and this recording will be available uh, on our YouTube channel after uh, the session today as well. All right, so just quickly, uh, who are we and, and what are we doing uh, here? Um, uh, the, the Midwest Big Data Innovation Hub is part of the, the NSF national network of four regional uh, innovation hubs focused on data science uh, and building communities and collaborations across the country, but uh, specifically within our geographic regions as well. Uh, and so if you're watching this uh, video from outside the Midwest 12 state region, uh, we encourage you to reach out to one of the hubs uh, in, in your part of the country to learn about the, the programs that they have and, and to get involved with the work that they do as well. Uh, I also wanted to mention that we have looked at um, uh, programs from different agencies on this call previously uh, for early career faculty. Um, and so there's a, a list of those here. You can find these again on our website for this program. Uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, even though some of these are a couple of years old at this point, we have had uh, program directors from the agencies and, and prior awardees on those calls as well. And uh, a lot of that advice that they provided at that time, I think is really still relevant to uh, early career proposers and, and mid-career mid folks as well. And so uh, definitely encourage you to check those out if you are uh, interested in any of those programs. I think we, we had a lot of uh, great guests with a lot of uh, good insights for proposers to hear about. Um, we also have had se several sessions on uh, training and workforce development kinds of programs. Uh, and, and so sort of adjacent to the work that we're talking about today, uh, thinking about building capacity in, in education and workforce development uh, around some of these topics. Uh, we have quite a few prior sessions on those as well. So I would encourage you to explore uh, any of those recordings and slides uh, if you have interest in that space. All right, but today we're focused on uh, the career program. Uh, this is a, a longstanding program, as I said, uh, from NSF that cuts across all of the directorates there uh, and, and is really the, the premier program for early career faculty support. Um, you can find the solicitation uh, uh, just by searching for that 22-586 uh, number um, uh, and uh, uh, it, it's a really rich solicitation, a lot of, a lot of really useful guidance within that document. Uh, and so, as we always say on this call, uh, reading that, that solicitation thoroughly and, and talking through it with your 
colleagues and, and your uh, research development folks at your institution uh, is really important to make sure that you're submitting a proposal that uh, meets uh, what NSF is looking for. Uh, in this case, uh, proposals are due uh, in uh, late July. So you have some time uh, to you know, really dig into a, a substantial proposal at this point and, and get uh, support from your institution to do that. Uh, we we're try to do this uh, webinar early in the year so that folks have time to think uh, about what you'd like to propose uh, into that uh, session. So let's talk a little bit about the, the uh, details of the program. So uh, this is a case where there's a lot of opportunity, I think, for faculty members. There's, there's roughly 500 of these awards made each year. Uh, that's, a, that's a tremendous number of awards. Uh, most programs that you'll propose into as a PI don't have anywhere near that number of awards made. And so there's a lot of opportunity, but there's also a lot of competition. Uh, and, and as we said, this is a very prestigious award. And so uh, having a, a really solid proposal is really important here. Um, we'll talk about some of the components of these proposals uh, in a minute here, but uh, the basic uh, size is a, a budget that's a minimum of 400,000 uh, over a period of, of up to five years. Um, for most of the uh, directorates at NSF that you would be proposing to, uh, there are some exceptions uh, up to $500,000 for people proposing work that aligns with the, the bioengineering or polar program uh, sections of, of NSF. Uh, again, all of this detail is in the solicitation, but that gives you a, a rough idea of how much funding we're talking about and what sort of time frame that you want to keep in mind. Career awards are eligible for supplements. And so, uh, you know, understanding how the supplement process works at NSF and what is an allowable cost there uh, is something to think about. But, um, you know, you want to try to, to build your budget for that period and, and scope the work that you're doing there to, to meet that um, basic budget uh, without uh, relying upon supplements for that. Um, there is no requirement in this program for a letter of intent or a pre-proposal, uh, but the solicitation does mention that proposers are encouraged to reach out to a program director uh, at NSF within the, the directorate or division that aligns with your research to talk about uh, you know, the concept that you have and, and whether that uh, is appropriate for uh, this particular program. And so uh, as, we, as we've mentioned on this call before, it can be a little intimidating for early faculty to uh, have that first contact with a program director. Uh, but as we have seen over and over in the solicitations, that is really highly encouraged that you reach out to them and, and have that conversation. Uh, that's part of the the work that they do there is, is interacting with proposers. And so uh, don't feel uh, intimidated by doing that. Just make sure that you have a, a you know, one page summary of, of what you're trying to propose and, and be ready to talk about that when you uh, connect with them. Um, again, we'll talk in a minute about eligibility in more uh, detail here, but uh, a couple of things to point out. Um, you can only submit one proposal for each annual cycle of this program. Uh, so if you have a couple of interesting ideas, uh, you really need to winnow those down to one uh, concept that you're going to, to focus on. And there is a restriction uh, of uh, three, three proposals over the lifetime uh, of your submission to this program. Uh, so you can have one awarded uh, out of those three attempts uh, but but beyond that, um, uh, you cannot propose, you know, indefinitely to this program. So, for example, if you uh, were awarded uh, a career award on your first or second try, uh, you can't apply again after you've been awarded. Um, if you were not awarded on your first or second try, you can apply, you know, a third time. Uh, but but after that, you know, you're not eligible uh, anymore. So. 
Uh, we have heard from from multiple prior awardees that they didn't get uh, awarded the first time around, and they had to revise their proposal, rethink things a little bit, and and resubmit again. And so, uh, I would say that's not unusual from from what we've heard from proposers to have to uh, go through more than one cycle there. Uh, okay, so just quickly, uh, who is uh, eligible under under this idea of early career. So within the solicitation, they give you a number of different requirements that you would have to meet as of the, the due date of the proposal in July, that you have to have a uh, doctoral degree, uh, you have to be engaged in, in certain kinds of research and have a particular appointment at your institution. So just be mindful of, of these restrictions and, and make sure that you're uh, able to meet those by the due date. Um, the who you know what what organization uh, is eligible in terms of of where you're working? It, it is pretty broad, so it can be higher education institutions of various kinds, uh, but also uh, nonprofits and and other organizations like museums and observatories and and research labs. So uh, a lot of flexibility in terms of where you're located uh, in terms of, of those organizations as well. Uh, we won't go through all these points here. I tried to pull out some examples from the solicitation about specific guidance that uh, NSF is is providing to proposers. Uh, so these these are mostly direct quotes from the solicitation, and you'll want to read through the the context here. But uh, you know they they as usual give you a lot of guidance about what they're looking for, what specifically you should include in your proposal. Um, and some some guidance as well on how that proposal will be reviewed. Um, you know what what specifically the review panel will be looking at in terms of their criteria. So again, great to read that in advance and make sure that uh, if you look at your proposal, uh, are you answering all those questions uh, as you're as you're uh, telling the story of your research there? Um, so what is the what does the proposal look like? I would say if you are familiar with NSF proposals at all, it looks uh, somewhat familiar uh, to that model. So you have a program or excuse me, a project description, which is uh, 15 pages in this case and uh, really helps you uh, tell that story of, of what your project is about and what you're trying to do there. Um, they give you, again, lots of guidance in the solicitation about what they want to see there. Um, uh, and in this case in particular, uh, you know, you're telling the story of your research, but also how your research connects to other parts of your career, like your teaching, for example, uh, if that's part of your appointment, uh, your outreach, engagement, uh, other kinds of broader impacts that your research may have uh, beyond those initial uh, uh research publications and so forth. So thinking about your career, not just not just your specific research uh, project, but how that fits into your overall career and telling that story here is uh, really important, I think. Um, you need to have a budget, of course, and, and a justification for that, and the, the narrative associated with that. Um, and then there's some uh, su supplementary documents that need to be attached as well, you know, really important in this case is the letter of uh, commitment from your institution talking about uh, your eligibility uh, in relation to those requirements that we talked about before, um, how your uh, appointment fits into the department and uh, uh, supports the, the research that that group does, um, and what kind of mentoring your uh, institution is going to help provide as a part of this award. So again, make sure that you're you're looking at those specific elements and and getting uh, help from your department uh, as you develop the proposal. Um, if you are uh, collaborating with uh, folks who have uh, data sets that you're going to use or or equipment that you need in order to do your research, um, you will want to document that in your proposal and have a letter of collaboration from 
uh, any of those partners um, as well. And there is a specific format that those letters have to be in that you need to be mindful of as well. Um, so, so think about, uh, again, in advance, who you're going to need to work with uh, to be successful in your research. Um, we should mention, though, that this, this is uh, meant to be a single PI uh, kind of proposal. There's, there's not a, a co-PI uh, uh, model like you might see in other research grants. And so uh, NSF is really restricting this to you as the, the primary researcher and, and the focus on your career development for this particular program. Um, you may be able to include uh, consultants or other senior personnel uh, who are going to provide support uh, on the project, and you may be able to budget for students and, and other uh, kinds of, of items there, but this is really about your research and, and developing your research career. Uh, a couple of links here that I wanted to mention. Uh, there is a supplementary document from NSF for this program that breaks down some of the uh, the milestones and, and elements for submitting uh, these proposals. And that is really important to look at if uh, your institution is not, um, uh, you know, an R1 scale university where, where these are going in pretty frequently. Um, if your organization is not registered with the U.S. government to receive grants or, or is a, a smaller institution that may not have a big uh, proposal development staff, um, this becomes even more important because of the timing associated with that. And so again, make sure that you're looking at these kinds of uh, documents and, and information as early as possible in the process. Um, there is a note that some uh, NSF directorates and programs um, may try to keep uh, their uh, career awards to the, the minimum uh, amount, uh, as we talked about, uh, in terms of, of budget. And so, um, you know, part of the, the discussion that you're going to have with, with your, um, your mentors and, and, and as you think about the scope of your work is, uh, how much money do I really need to do uh, what I need to do? And so that that's important to reflect on. And, and one way that you can get some help there, I think, is looking at prior awards that have been made. Um, we have a list on our uh, website of, of career awards made in our Midwest region. Um, and that can help, I think, looking at uh, what successful programs uh, look like in terms of their scope and uh, you know, looking for somebody in a field similar to yours. Uh, what what kind of project did they do? How big was it? How many people were involved? What kind of data did they use and, and equipment? Um, that can help give you an idea of how to scope your uh, particular project in this case. So uh, I would give that a look. Um, we have quite a few of those uh, on our site um, to, to give you some guidance there as well. Um, okay, so before we uh, move on, uh, I wanted to uh, call on Dr. Lee and, and see if I have missed anything important in this, uh, you know, very high level view of the program that we should mention before we move on here. Uh, I think your presentation is very comprehensive, uh, covers almost everything. There's only one thing I want to emphasize that for Korea, which is different from other research programs is that for career you need to have integration of research and education right include both thank you right so tell us a little more about that because you know i think a lot of new faculty members they've had some research experience probably with their their pi mentor as a grad student and and maybe they have um been involved in teaching a little bit through uh, different uh, sections of, of basic courses, but maybe they are just now starting to do teaching, you know, of their own courses and developing course materials, things like that. Um, what what are you all looking for in the proposal around the, the non-research elements there and how to connect those pieces together? What What makes sense for new faculty to think about there? Right. Uh, the key word here is integration of research and education, right? So you 
when you're writing your proposal in terms of research, at the time, you should also include education into it. I, we saw some proposal is that they write the entire research, and then at the end, they realize they need to add education. They write one half paragraph or one paragraph of education, and those are not sufficient. So when you're writing, your, oh, the whole research part should have uh, education in mind as well during the research part, right? Great, thanks, and, and we'll maybe hear from Crystal in a little bit about how that worked yes. out for, for, her. for her. Yes. Um, great, all right, thanks for that input. Um, so before we move on to Crystal, I did want to uh, make a quick note uh, that um, our last um, webinar in this series will be coming up next month uh, on the 22nd, where we'll look at the, the joint um, NSF-NIH program around data science in health. Uh, we have a couple of program directors from NIH joining for that call as well. So if you have an interest in the, the data science and health area, uh, we encourage you to join us next month for that. Um, also on this slide, we have some links about the career program in particular, and so the, the list of contacts within the directorates at NSF, uh, as well as some upcoming uh, events that, that may be of interest to you as well. There's a, a full day workshop that the Education Directorate uh, will be hosting in mid-May, uh, but a lot of programs have uh, recurring office hours every couple of weeks, uh, and, and talking about this program is, is one of the things that they will be doing. So the Bio Division and the Engineering Division will both have office hours about career coming up in May as well. Um, so, you know, we've got the links here about the, the prior NSF uh, webinars that, that are the official version of what we're doing here today. But uh, Dr. Lee, can you mention uh, the, the workshop that is held annually for uh, um, career uh, uh, yes. uh, proposers in, in the size and, and CI space? Right, um, we have one every year for size. And usually in April, and this year it will be next week, Monday and Tuesday. Um, Monday is the workshop itself, and Tuesday is the visit to this uh, NSF building. And then to, uh, um, start from Wednesday all the way to Friday, you can sign up for one on one meeting with the program directors mm -hmm. virtually. Right. So the first day, the workshop is in person. Uh, hybrid, hybrid. You can also sign up to attend hybrid uh, online as well. And besides that, we also have the entire NSFY the workshop on the career program. And that one, I think one uh, both uh, in May, uh, sometime in May, you will see the announcement soon. Great, thank you for that. Um, so, you know, if you are interested in this program, but you're not necessarily ready to pr to propose uh, to the July 24 deadline, um, you may want to keep that that annual workshop in mind for next year and, and think about attending that. Uh, it, it sounds like a, a great way to uh, meet the program directors in your area and and experience, uh, you know, the the NSF. Uh, uh, environment uh, in, in Alexandria. So keep that in mind. Um, you can look at the, the prior webinars that we have linked here, but there will be one coming up uh, as well. So uh, just, just keep that in mind. Um, but let's move on now to open discussion here. We'll, we'll be ready for any uh, audience questions that you have. Feel free to put those in the chat at any point. Um, but let's start with Crystal. Um, you um, uh, were awarded uh, in when 2019? Is it is it three or four yeah, years? Yeah, I submitted yeah. a proposal in 2019 and a got funding in 2020. Yeah. Yeah, great. So you uh, have had a, a couple of years now to uh, work on that research. Um, so maybe you can tell us a little about what that that process looked like for you uh, proposing into this program, and then maybe how that has impacted your research uh, since then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, John. You give a very good introduction. It makes me recall the exciting time period when I developed my own proposal. Uh, yeah, I got 
funded in 2020, and I participated in panel review of a career proposal one year later. So it gives me an excellent chance to think from both angles as a proposal writer and a reviewer. Uh, I would be happy to share some of my observations uh, during developing my own proposals and review others' proposals. Uh, there are a few things I think that is very important. Uh, the top one on my list uh, is education. So we may have uh, heard many times that career proposal is not a research proposal, uh, but an integrated research and education plan. Uh, I think it's uh, never too much to uh, emphasize the integration of both. Uh, it's important to demonstrate how your uh, proposed research could be connected to and contribute to your research, uh, education plan. So on the panel discussion, the common issues people may point out include uh, the education part is uh, very novel, but it's unclear how this uh, how we why we need such a specific research to support the education activities or the research part is uh, excellent uh, but we found the education is too generic standard and nothing new so you can see the education part and its integration with the uh, research plan uh, could easily become a killer or make uh, or be something that make the reviewers speak highly of your proposal. So I think this part is very important and needs to spend uh, lots of time and effort to improve. And the second thing is novelty. So in a panel review, we often discuss whether this uh, proposal uh, would lead to breakthrough contributions or just the incremental work. So how different is it compared to the existing studies? Uh, as the PI, we have the responsibility to develop a well thought plan and articulate the entire story very clearly. Uh, so to this end, it is important to clarify how the proposed research and education activity uh, could link to the current status of knowledge and what's the novel part. And so I, I think for reviewers, both act uh, ad, hoc, ad hoc and panel reviewers are looking for such a thing uh, in your proposal. And once you have such a thing, maybe try to write it down and talk with your colleagues about it and test if you can convince them. Uh, this is important. This is what we need in this field. And then the follow-up question in the proposal is why you? And I think for uh, a good uh, career proposal, the URL did a good job in showing the balance between the novelty and the feasibility. So you might be able to address the question from uh, different angles or emphasize different things, but it will be great if uh, all those things can be come back, can be supported by your experience, your proven record, your capability. So this is also uh, important and uh, yeah, the reviewer will look, look at that. And the third thing is uh, try to avoid the jargon and develop a, a good structure. So you remember the panel will include the people from different backgrounds uh, with a different expertise and a focus. So we may not expect all of them can understand everything we write. And so as it will help a lot if you can uh, have a well laid out structure and make your proposal easy to follow. So for example, when you develop the career proposal, you must have a good understanding about uh, uh, what's uh, going on for this topic in the research community. And you may also have the prior work in your own group and you have things proposed to do. So reviewer will appreciate it a lot if you can clearly state the objectives, uh, hypothesis, rationale, and prior work. This partially answered why you question, and then the proposed activity. So here, the having having a, a good structure 
and tell the story in a very organized and a neat way will increase in, increase your opportunity a lot. And uh, the first thing on my list uh, would be uh, how to evaluate a success. So this, uh, I think this is another question uh, the reviewers would often ask. So do you have a clear picture in your mind about the uh, success of this project? So like what, what are the deliverables uh, developed from this project and uh, how to make your hypothesis tested uh, true or false or what impact will it uh, generate from this project? So all those uh, kind of a question will, uh, if you can develop a matrix that can help people understand whether and how the success of this project can be evaluated. So I, I think these are the important things when you develop the proposal. And if, of course, uh, for me and my experiences, uh, the career project is a huge support for my career. Uh, of course, the first thing is you will have uh, five years stable financial support uh, to explore the question you really want to do. Uh, that, that is uh, undoubtedly important. And other things is uh, that provide a very good uh, platform that can help you to uh, build a collaboration with others. And in this community, maybe there are other scientists or uh, people, different people working on this topic. I think especially with this uh, outreach and education components, uh, to me, it sort of opened a different door. Uh, previously, I mostly work as a researcher. So I focus, maybe focus more of my eyesight on research parts, but adding the uh, education parts is indeed very helpful. Yeah. Right, and also education will help with broader impact, right? Yes, yeah. yes, definitely. Uh, like in my projects, uh, I uh, one of the interesting uh, education activities we propose to develop a online watershed game. So that game will be supported by the uh, the research and data analysis developed uh, in the research components. So yeah, with these two uh, integrate together, I think it gives us a lot of uh, you know, interesting outcomes. Right. Great. I just put on the chat the email address to reach for a career. If you have a career proposal, you're not sure which division to submit, that is the place. You email there, they would immediately find out for you which one where you should submit. And just now I mentioned there's an NSF, why the entire NSF career workshop uh, webinar. And I also put in the chat. It's uh, May 3rd, uh, 3 p.m. Eastern, and May 9, 2 p.m. Eastern. Right, that's an additional one. Okay, sorry to interrupt. Crystal, continue. <laughs> oh, no, um, uh, I basically shared the thing I want to. If there's any further question, yeah, be happy to right. share. Yeah, thank, thank you both for that information. Um, uh, it doesn't look like you can register for those webinars yet uh, on the NSF website, but make sure that you put those on your calendar if you are interested. I'm sure they'll be up there soon. Um, so, Crystal, thank you. That was really enlightening to have you give us some of that advice. Um, I'm wondering, in your case, um, you know, you you were doing research before you became a faculty member. Um, what what do you think? Um, you know, coming into this proposal, what was helpful for you to think about and and who who were some of your mentors who who helped you with this? did Did you have your uh, PhD advisor uh, helping still or or folks at Iowa state in in proposal development? what What was helpful to you along the way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. This is a very good question. Of course, my PhD advisor helped a lot. Uh, we're still very good collaborator right now and have uh, good uh, collaborations until today. Uh, and so I think the, because uh, my career proposal focused on the uh, land to aquatic uh, nutrient loading. 
So uh, at Iowa State, this is a perfect place to look at that. And we have uh, many outstanding colleagues who have done the long-term uh, water quality monitoring work. So they have uh, supported me a lot with uh, the precious data resources. And also through them, I uh, realized the, uh, like initially the, maybe the thing we use to drive model is sort of a course. And identify a few things that the modeling uncertainty may come from. So that's uh, uh, also inspire me to do improvements in my career projects. So I think this uh, at the first uh, a few years of uh, uh, my, uh, at, uh, for me as a system professor at Iowa State, uh, give me a lot of uh, good opportunity to learn about the landscape in the Midwest, the, including also the farming practices and the major challenge we are having. So all this come together, I think they become a strong support to for me to form the my career idea and also make the project uh, uh, moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And and so you know your your project was very interdisciplinary. You had water people and, and agriculture and, and other uh, elements to that. Um, can you talk a little about that that element of the proposal where you you have letters of collaboration from different people to get access to you know that that water data, for example, and those kinds mm -hmm. of pieces? Yeah, because uh, for the water quality modeling, uh, I'm my uh, particular strength is on the process based uh, uh, ecosystem modeling, and we have uh, many data accumulated actually in this field from different scales. So for example, like my colleagues, uh, Dr. Bill Crompton, they work at a very uh, small scale, catchment scale. Their uh, water drainage basin just uh, several square kilometers. And we also have uh, colleagues from at the University of Iowa. They have uh, uh, multiple monitoring gauges that looking at uh, the water quality at larger watershed scales. So all of, all those uh, cross scale modeling data monitoring data give us a good database to improve model and make the uh, prediction become more reliable. So I think yeah, th those are definitely precious uh, precious treasure for us. That's great. Uh, I want to go to uh, Jenny Lee in a minute to talk about the review process here. But uh, Crystal, have you? Uh, served on an NSF review panel uh, either before or after your, your award? Yeah, yeah. I uh, served have to on mention, the career panel. Like yeah. in we don't have to mention which which panel, but uh, yeah. I, you know, I think that that is a, <laughs> a, a valuable experience for proposers to have, you know, to, to be able to see what that process looks like from the inside. Okay, so here's a diagram about the life cycle proposals. Can we see that? Yes, thank you. Yes, that okay, great. great, good, good. That is from PAPPG, that is a public document, right? And as you can see here, um, you submit. Uh, first, we have a solicitation. You already talked about the solicitation number for the career. And then the research uh education community this uh submit the proposal through currently is research.gov or grants.gov right either one and then nsf received the proposal the program directors like us we have to decide on how we're going to review them and for career mostly will be reviewed by a panel plus an ad hoc review. Sometimes, for instance, one example is that one proposal submitted to us, it's an AI proposal, and uh, we do AI in OAC, but we also have some specific area of AI. So we went to the IS and asked them to invite additional ad hoc proposal, uh, ad hoc reviews for this proposal, uh, which means there's a combination of them. And uh, for the career, mostly those three green ones. There's some other proposals. We also do internal reviews, but that's not for career. And after the review, in my in our case, is that we have several panels, right? 
and we put it all together into something called portfolio. And then we do the analysis and a recommendation based on the entire portfolio of all the proposals. Could be the entire, say, entire OAC, all the proposal together. Say we have hundreds of them. We just rank them and put them all together after the review. And then so the division director, we make the recommendation, try to balance the portfolio, and then we make the, the uh, recommendation to the division directors. In our case, it's office director. And then so we discussion and then make the final decision. Uh, once we make the final decision that's not final, we send it to DGA and then DGA will review the budget, review everything, everything looks good. Then they send to the organization her award. So oh, that is the final stage. So for us, even we pick that, it's not the final. The final one is by DGA, the di uh, division of agreement, uh, a grant and agreement. So they make the final decision uh, based on the, uh, the budget. So uh, totally this one, the last stage is about a month and the reviews about six months. And the beginning there, about uh, you need a 90 days. So the solicitation need to be out for at least 90 days before the first uh, submission. But now for Korea, solicitation is there a long time now, right? It's been mm -hmm. a while. So the submission open. Um, and the deadline is July 27 this year. I think it's July 27. Right. Sometime in July, towards the end of the July. Look at the solicitation to get the like, exact day. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah, thank you. That's, yes. that's very helpful to see that process in, in a diagram. Um, and, you know, that we, we often hear that it takes uh, six months to go through that review cycle. And we can see that on the, the chart here. And, and sometimes you'll hear that your proposal has been recommended for funding. And, and it's basically at that state where the... the exactly. Uh, yeah, it's the, right. Yeah. The recommended has agreed, but it hasn't gone through the DGA cycle yet, right? So exactly. You're, DGA you're... is the final one. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that one takes about a month. Right. So let, let's talk a little bit more about that that panel review cycle because mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in some NSF proposal or, or solicitations, you'll see the standard merit review criteria, the intellectual merit and broader impacts, which you see in, in the career uh, yes. solicitation. Yes. Uh, and sometimes you'll also see some additional review criteria that, that panelists will look at when they do their right. reviews. Um, we don't see that in the career solicitation. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little about what the, the panels for career are uh, looking at in, in relation to, you know, an early career person. This is not someone with a lot of experience who has been awarded from NSF many times, who, who knows what intellectual merit and, and broader impacts means. What are, what are they looking at for an early career person that may be a little different in that situation? Okay. Uh, before I go to that, there's one correction. It's a, the deadline is July 24th this year. Thank you. Great. Thank right. you. Yeah. So, Right, so uh, for the review, uh, I'm going to scroll down to some of our review slides. And uh, uh, only one additional one, right? We have intellectual memory, broader impact, and then plus the education plan. So those are the one. Um, we also check eligibility. Those are the checking. It's mm -hmm. like either eligible or non-eligible. But in terms of the funding decisions, those are the... Uh, Okay, so we evaluate the two merit review criteria, and then we have additional one, which is integration of research and education, which we already talked a lot about that. And those two, the other one is international merit and broader impact. Those two are the review criteria for every proposals, right? right. So those are the ones. And Great, if you submit you. to some other programs, might, might have additional one, but Korea, those other ones. Right. Yeah. So uh, again, that that integration piece is really, really important yes. for proposers to think about, yeah, so that they're the story that they're telling is including all of those elements. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. Bye. Great. Thanks. 
Okay. All right. Are there any other questions that our audience has at this point? We have uh, about 10 minutes left. Uh, we can certainly take some, some questions as well. Are there any other um, prior awardees on, on the call who might be able to share their experience? No, I guess not. Um, Crystal, maybe we'll go back to you and, and think about, um, you know, this is meant to be uh, one of the first uh, proposals you develop as a new faculty member, and that helps you do a couple of things in the future. It helps to get your research going uh, and do that integration with the other parts of your uh, appointment and, and your work. Um, but hopefully it's going to lead to something else. You're going to get some results that are meaningful and, and uh, help you think about what to research next, right? And so can you talk a little about how the career award is, is driving what you do in your research uh, after this? Yeah, thank you. This is a good question. Yeah, the uh, after the career uh, proposal, actually during the implementation of the career projects, uh, uh, we did find something that, uh, like if I rewrite a proposal, I may improve that some technical details or something uh, we didn't realize before. But during the implementation pro process, we realized, wow, this is very important. We should have this developed. It could be like model input data. We should have this better uh, to improve the model accuracy. So this kind of thing, I think, uh, we developed them uh, that including both uh, knowledge, our uh, recognition, and uh, uh, the modeling capability, we developed them step by step. And actually, this uh, uh, the career project, the thing we focus on the nitrogen loading, that is a concept of water pollution. And last year, we got another NSF project focused on flooding prediction. So that uh, follows the similar thought of mm -hmm. my career projects, but sort of uh, broaden our capability and use the uh, approach, the method framework uh, to broaden our uh, territory from the uh, water quality to flood prediction. I think this is uh, yeah something that is uh, very interesting and that's uh, definitely a product built upon the uh, career projects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so again, when you're when you're initially thinking about your proposal to career, you're you're coming from a certain background, you know, maybe research that you did with your faculty men mentor as a PhD student. Uh, you probably had to make some choices at that stage about what to work on. You have to make some choices here as well. But you know, longer term, you're thinking about other interesting projects and other places where your research may apply. And so that that could be a good time uh, after the career to start thinking about where those connections are and how to build on on what you've done. So it sounds like you are definitely down that road uh, as well, Crystal. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. This this is a very helpful process. As I said, what, what would you develop the proposal? That's uh, yeah, career project is different from others. It help you to think through what I will be in the next five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. So for example, in my lab, I may have uh, uh, different directions I want to explore, but the career project, the idea, I think, uh, as I said, you need to find the balance between the novelty and uh, feasibility. So to me, this is uh, a, great uh, idea I want to explore. I think that for other researchers that the same thing, and you may have many things you can do and many things you want to do, and but there's uh, a great combination in this uh, career project. So I think it's worth uh, thinking it over and sleeping with your ideas and selecting the best one you want to explore. That's a very helpful process for your lab to grow up, for you to uh, sort out those great ideas. 
Right. Yeah. right. And yeah. another important thing after you receive a award is to write good reports and on time. Right. It's like in your case that you need to have an on-time report in, for, in, for, in order for you to get another award, right? Yeah. Right. And uh, especially for OAC in our case, when you write your report, we're looking for the links to your source code to data, right? This is a big data hub. So where your data coming from, mm -hmm. any new data you collected, those we're looking for in the reports, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point for this this particular audience. I didn't see a requirement for a data management plan in the solicitation, but is that sort of expected at this point for data associated with these projects? Uh, yes, right. If you collect any data or you use any data, it's very nice, very important to put in a report or put in your proposal. In many, many cases in the review, I remember people asking, review asking question, where are we going to get data to do this work? Right. If we're not clear where the data are coming from, and uh, or where you're going to collect the data, then it definitely hurts the your reviews. So mm -hmm. in the proposal, it'd be nice to to have example of the source of your data. Right. Great. Um, and Jenny, one last question for you about sure. the review sure. process. So yes. Um, uh, you know, in, in OAC, you may be receiving, like you said, uh, something involving AI for one of these projects, but maybe, you know, maybe the proposer's home directorate is, is bio or geo or something because that's where their, uh, their, their home discipline is. So how does that work in terms of the review panel? Do you have ad hoc reviews from OAC that go into the the geo review, for example, how, what, how should that, the, that's the a great question. That? That's a great question. OAC is interdisciplinary. If you remember, OAC originally was right under NSF, right? Yeah. Cover all the fields, right? Because our infrastructure is useful to every field, right? And uh, therefore, we do receive many, many proposals. I would say actually more than half of proposals, they, are, ha they have a domain. Uh, they're using some infrastructure with certain domain. And uh, often, uh, I have one situation I talk about, we use a hard review to get additional review for the proposal. And oftentimes, we actually have something called co-review. For instance, if we have a proposal, proposal related to the geo, right, and we review it and geo review it. And uh, if we, we both review well, then we can co-fund it, right? And even if um, in some situations, uh, we could just fund it ourselves. If, if the geo think this is a great one, but they run out the funding or something, or they can just fund it themselves if they really like it, right? So we do co-reviews co or we do the AHA reviews to support those interdisciplinary ones. And besides that, sometimes uh, in the panel, uh, we try to, when, uh, when we invite panelists, so we look at the list of the proposals, look at the topics. So we try to find the panelists with the relevant expertise in the field. Right. So right. that's yeah. our solution for that. But yeah. you're right. OAC is very, very interdisciplinary. Yes. So if I'm uh, developing a proposal and, and maybe I, I'm uh, doing work in, in biology, and so I would be in the bio directorate normally, but I have a strong, you know, database or CI element. Yes. Uh, part of that conversation with the, the program director uh, prior to submitting a proposal might be uh, deciding what what directorate to designate when I when I submit. Is that right? Right, correct. So for career, you're allowed to pick one primary and one secondary. So in this case, you decide you want bio to be primary or OAC as a primary, right? If you pick OAC as primary, you can pick the bio as a secondary or you can reverse that either way, right? So make sure you can, there's a way to submit it. Actually, it's on the cover page of the proposal. You can pick uh, otherwise. And actually, I saw some proposal even pick three. I don't know how they get in there, but they picked three. <laughs> <laughs> right. Great. All right. That's very helpful. Right. Um, okay. Well, we are almost out of time here. So I want to thank uh, Jenny and Crystal. You know, having your input today is really helpful for proposers who haven't uh, had much NSF experience and, and uh, are really thinking about how to build their career through this program. And so thanks so much for being on the call and, and helping us to see how that uh, works out in practice. 
Thank you for inviting us. Thank Contact you. us, email us if you have any questions. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.